Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now recently I've been doing a lot of deal hunting on Facebook's marketplace and yesterday I came across a pretty decent deal on some old high-end hardware from 2012. Now this bundle I found consisted of a Z77 Sabertooth 1155 board, an old i7 3770K, as well as this pretty beastie looking aftermarket cooler. Back in 2012 this would have been some pretty high-end stuff and I was able to get it all for £129. The seller was selling them all individually but I came in with a bulk offer and to my very surprise they actually accepted it which was pretty cool. That got me thinking, six years ago this would have been some of the best top-notch equipment money can buy. Considering I was able to get all of this for less than the price of a modern day Ryzen 5 processor, I wonder just how good it was by today's standards. So let's discuss the individual parts before jumping into a few benchmarks to find out. First of all let's talk about the board. This is an ASUS Z77 Sabertooth 1155 socket motherboard and back in 2012 it was very expensive. Even today it retails for stupid money in most cases. I paid £60 for this one. It offers multiple PCIe Express slots, support for up to 32 gigs of DDR3, and comes equipped with USB 3 ports at the back. One thing I don't like is this thermal armour. It looks cool, but to ensure it stays cool, there are two mini fans connected to it that make quite a loud noise when loading programs. These can be turned off in the BIOS, but they'll still turn on from time to time on their own accord. You can always disconnect them though. I'd still consider this pretty feature rich and with support for overclocking and top notch albeit older i7s it's still a great component. The downside is of course that it only supports what most would call a dead socket. That brings me on to this, the i7-3770K. With 4 cores and 8 threads and a reasonable used price this still sounds like a great deal in 2018 and considering I paid £60 for this too I think that was quite a bargain. Releasing in 2012, this unlocked variant of the 3770 has fantastic overclocking potential, and thanks to this board we can do just that. Before getting into that though, let's look at this mammoth CPU cooler. I'm told this one has been keeping the i7 cool for a good few years, and it certainly looks the part. A sign of a decent CPU cooler is always the big and heavy fan. So with our collection of top tier parts gathered, Let's put them together and see how well they do with a GTX 1070 and 8 gigs of DDR3 memory. First things first, it was time to check out gaming. Immediately I jumped into the BIOS and fiddled with the CPU speed. I left the BIOS screen with the CPU at a very modest 4.2 GHz overclock, but it was an overclock I feel that should be achievable by most without the nervous, oh dear it's going to break feeling. I then thought, OK, let's do it anyway, and crank things up to 4.5. Bear in mind then that the MSI Afterburner stats in the top left corner are mislabeled, considering our CPU is now running at a faster speed. With Assassin's Creed Odyssey here, the i7 paired with the GTX 1070 ran the game pretty well at ultra settings. Now, Odyssey isn't exactly the best optimised game in the world, so we averaged around 40 FPS here, which isn't too different from my Ryzen 5, but we'll get onto that in a minute because I will have a bit more of a comparison occurring a little later on. Here, the i7 more than held its own, and... At no point did I see it maxing out at 100% usage, it didn't even get to 99% usage and I feel that these two in a system still make a great pair. Even considering the i7's age, it pairs with a 1070 very well and the 8 gigs of RAM was also more than enough to keep this running smoothly. One thing I want to note in terms of the comparison before we get to it later is how much stutter was eliminated running this game with the i7 than with my Ryzen 5 1600. The game stutters a lot more um, on the AMD based CPU which is quite odd considering that's a lot newer and single core performance doesn't really vary all that much but as I say we'll talk about that in a little more detail a bit further along in the video. Call of Duty World War 2 next and again we were seeing stupid frame rates with a mixture of high and extra settings. I mean stupid in a good way because our frame rate was ridiculously high. Again when paired with the GTX 1070, the 3770K at 4.5GHz was in no way a bottleneck. In fact it complemented the GPU rather quite well. 
One thing's for certain, Call of Duty World War 2 certainly ran a treat. And this is quite a graphically intensive game once you turn the settings up. You can make this look like an older generation COD if you turn everything to low, but it does look good at extra settings, I have to admit. Fortnite, a pretty simple looking title, but one that can be quite demanding, thanks to its use of the Unreal Engine, also ran quite well. One thing to point out is that while I was waiting to join the game, you know, when you and all the other players are just sort of running around gormlessly, that was where we saw quite a few frame dips. The game hovered around 60 FPS and dropped to around 40 on some instances. I don't know if that's because every single player was on screen at the time or the game was just loading assets in the background. I really don't know how it works. But all I can say is it was pretty stuttery at that point. Yet when we jumped out of the bus and landed on the island itself and we were running around looking for enemies, stuff like that, the gameplay really did smooth out and it was a pretty flawless experience with the high settings. Though there will be some places outdoors where that frame rate does drop, yet it was still more than playable in my opinion and once again the CPU was no way maxed out or even close to it. Here we have The Witcher 3, another very graphically intensive title, albeit a few years old now, it can still put a lot of even the most high-end hardware through its paces, and 2012's i7-3770K here did a fantastic job of keeping our frame rates smooth. With the ultra settings here and the post-processing set to high, we averaged around 70 frames per second, which is a pretty decent achievement if you ask me. In fact, the GTX 1070 was more of a bottleneck than the processor, Finally, it's Rainbow Six Siege. Once again, stupid frame rates, 126 FPS on average. This average was taken from the benchmark run along with the other figures, but I thought I'd show you some solo gameplay here just to get an idea of how it performs in the real world. Not really any status to speak of either. 79% uh, low there and a 59.1% low means that you'll have a very decent experience with this processor in your system, even when paired with a sort of decent mid-range to high-end card that is the GTX 1070. I was then curious to see how it would compare to say my Ryzen 5 1600, the CPU that I run at stock in my system on a daily basis. I looked this up on Google and it seems that it was quite a hot topic with some people not quite knowing whether or not to upgrade from their i7 to a Ryzen based system. When it actually came to gaming, results were very similar. Take Assassin's Creed Odyssey for example here, 49 FPS with the Ryzen 5 compared to 43 with the i7, a very close result. Yet, as I said before, the 0.1% low on the Ryzen was quite a bit lower. There was a lot more noticeable stutter here than with the i7-3770K. Battlefield 1 was also quite close in both instances. The Ryzen 5 saw a better average. In fact, all the figures were a lot better with the Ryzen processor. Yet the i7 still did a pretty fantastic job, not really often dropping below 60. Rainbow Six Siege, again you saw it perform on the i7, 126 FPS. The Ryzen 5 just edged it here with 130, and we saw slightly better minimum frame rates too. Yet, when it comes to real world gameplay, you're not going to feel these differences at all. But I just want to end on a few CPU comparisons because that's where you'll notice the most difference. For example, when we ran Cinebench R15, the multi-core test with the Ryzen 5 came back with a score of 1141, yet on the i7 we saw just 727. The single core performance was pretty much identical, the i7 edging it by one point, so you're not really going to notice any difference there. But what I will say is that thanks to all those extra cores, when it comes to rendering and using programs like Premiere Pro, a program I use on a daily basis, the Ryzen 5 will absolutely smash the i7-3770K in terms of rendering times and just how snappy the program feels overall. That's not to say that you can't edit or create content with the old i7 because it still does an absolutely fantastic job. All in all then, I think it was a pretty decent experience. This top tier tech from 2012 still does a pretty decent job. The processor is still more than capable. So if you're wondering whether you should buy into an old platform, if you're on a tight budget that is, then you should have no fear in doing so. I wouldn't advise taking a step backwards. <laughs> it wouldn't make any sense at all going from like a Ryzen back to the i7, unless like me, you want to see how long it lasts in terms of lifespan for whatever reason. But just know that if you're on a tight budget, you can afford an old school 
1155 based build and you want to go with something like an i7 then you should have a pretty decent time and of course it's not just this motherboard that allows overclocking so you should be able to pump out decent figures once you've overclocked it a little bit as well figures that can keep up almost with a modern day Ryzen 5 so I'm going to end the video there. I hope you guys have enjoyed this look back at what was once one of the best consumer desktop CPUs money could buy. If you did, leave a like on this video. Leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And hopefully, I'll see you all in the next one.